must go to stand in for the shamed for the cause of his great name we must go we must go to go befriend the lost carriers of peace at all costs we must go to every corner
Hello and welcome to our online worship experience here at Satterbeck Berlin. My name is Tony and I'm the pastor here. And my name is Jessica and I'm the Saddleback Kids Director. We are so excited to be offering Saddleback Kids back in person here at our Berlin campus for early childhood age three through first grade and elementary school age kids from second grade through sixth grade. We could not be more thrilled to offer this kids church experience back live in person for the kids to grow and learn about Jesus and to connect with God and with other kids. Space is limited here at our location, so please go on our website, on our visit page, to register your kids for each Sunday. You can also find a lot of great resources on our website under kids to check out videos from our Heyo Jesus Bible stories to worship songs that are translated into German for you, and they're in English and Spanish as well. We also love kids, and if you love kids too, and maybe you don't want to serve directly in the classroom, but there are many serving opportunities, we'd love to talk more to you about Saddleback Kids. If you have any questions, please reach out to me through kids at saddleback.de and I'd love to connect with you further. I want to welcome you today to our online worship experience here at Saddleback Berlin. Um, and I don't know if you watch on our website right now or on YouTube. If you watch on YouTube, there are a couple of links in the video description that I ask you to check out. If you are watching on our website, I like to talk about some features that you can see in our watch experience. First of all, there is a notes button. For every sermon, we offer you uh, a section where you can put down some notes. There are the main Bible verses of the sermon and you can use the save button to save all of your notes as a PDF on your computer. There is also a connect button on our watch experience and I encourage you to check it out either right now or after the sermon because this is our online connection card and you can use it to just say hello and just mention that you were there. You can give us feedback on what you like and what you didn't like on our service. You can indicate that you like to talk to a leader of our church or you want to find out more. You can um, send prayer requests or ask any question you like. And you can also look for a small group. So click on connect and we would love to hear from you. We also have a gift button on our watch experience. And so if you feel part of our church, you can use the gift button to donate online. You can use PayPal or you can uh, just copy and paste the IBAN, our bank account details in there as well. If you are a first time visitor, if you're just a guest, please don't feel obligated to give. This is just for people who feel part of our church. There is also a share button in our watch experience. So if you like the sermon that you're about to hear and you think more people should hear it and maybe you have some specific people in mind, use the share button to, to forward this to anyone you like to um, forward it to. There are other things on our website that you can discover as well. There is an About Us page that talks about our story, about our values and about our church in general. You can also click on find a small group under connect um, and look for a small group in your area. Or you can check out our event calendar to see upcoming events to be part uh, of that as well. And so we would love to hear from you. And now we hope you enjoy our online service. And if you want to be here in person next week, check out the information on our visit subpage. Body. It's good to have you today in church. If you don't mind, can you can we all rise and just sing this song together? Everyone needs forgiveness. The 
kindness of the Savior. Sing with me. 
to Jesus. You never fail, you never fail. So we believe in you, Jesus. We believe in you. Promise to stand.
since my God feelings you've never Come on. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never Thank you, Jesus. Because your promise still stands. What you said to us as a church still stands. We believe every word that we have heard, Lord, from our pastors. We believe the words from you, O God, from the Holy Spirit. We believe every word today that what you say and what you're saying and what you would say, O God, we would follow. Do it again, God. Thank you, Jesus. Wherever you are, just talk to God. It's a worship time. You and the Lord, just speak to him right now. Love on him. Worship him. He's your father. He wants to hear your voice. He desires to hear you talk to him. He wants to have a relationship. He wants you to have a relationship with him. And take this time right now, one minute, just speak to God. Wherever you are, yours might be, Lord, I need you in my family. Lord, I need to know you more. Lord, I need to love you more or help me with my health. I need healing. I need deliverance. That place, that point of need that you have where you need him, just speak to him right now. Hallelujah. Yeah. 
Sing together, great are you, Lord? Come on, great are you, Lord? For the bread He has given us, the life He has given us, we declare it to Him. Great are you, Lord? For being with us and our families, we sing to you, Jesus. Voices, great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Just great are you, Lord. Say, great are you, Lord. Till everybody sing it. Great are you, Lord Jesus. Great are you, Lord. Just one more time for that person who has not sang it. Great are you, Lord. Come on. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hi, this is Pastor Tony, and I'm so glad that you're with us here at our online service at Sederbeck, Berlin. Let me point out to you that um, you're invited to come to our in-person worship service every single Sunday, 11 a.m. to experience live worship, to experience fellowship with other Christians, and to listen to the same message that you can see in the, uh, in the online service. And so we would love to see you at our in-person services every Sunday, 11 a.m. at Colonia Nova. Also, this Monday, we will have our last class for this year. It will be class 301, it will be in English, and it will be a Zoom class starting at 6.30 p.m. This class is about discovering your ministry or discovering your shape. Your shape. Do you know that God created you for a purpose and that he shaped you for that purpose? And if you live your life according to that purpose, you will feel fulfilled in a way that you have never experienced that. But in order to do that, you need to find out how God shaped you. And this is what Class 301 is about. It's really about how did God create you. And so I know that you will love this class. If you have not taken this class or it's a long time ago, then sign up on our website and you will get all the information you need to join this class tomorrow evening at 6.30 p.m. We are currently in a sermon series called Relating to Humans and today Stacy Wood will preach about relating to difficult humans. I know there are difficult people in your life and I know that there are people in your life that think that you are difficult and so we all need to know how to relate to difficult people, how to have better relationships with difficult people, how can we put ourselves into their shoes and understand them in a better way. This is what Stacy Wood is going to talk about today and I'm so, um, yeah, so happy that we can share this message with you today and that we can learn all together how to be better in relating to difficult people. So let's get into today's sermon. Hey, I want to
wanna welcome you to Saddleback Church. I wanna welcome all 18 of our campuses. And those of you who are joining us online, our online family, we are so glad that you are joining us this weekend. And also, I wanna welcome our 35 extension campuses that are meeting around the world. Wow, this is, isn't it such a cool day and age to get to be a part of the church? Like we are one church with one heart and one mission and one purpose. And yet we are meeting all over the globe. It's such a cool thing to think about how we can do that. Well, you're joining us right now for week two of this message series about relating to humans. And it's really interesting how every time we do a message series about relationships, I mean, it just, it hits such a felt need for people. Because the reality is all of us are dealing with, with relationships in our life and relationships that aren't all the way that we wish that they were. Relationships that are difficult, relationships that are just hard to navigate, they're sticky, they're not as fun as we thought they would be. And so we're all dealing with these relationships. And so when, when we talk about this, it's like people are like, ah, oh, I really need to get here to hear some hope from our relationships. And the good news is the Bible talks a lot about how we should relate to one another. So we just wanted to spend a few weeks unpacking some of that instruction from the Bible about how can we have healthy relationships and relationships that, that build one another up, relationships that honor God. And so last week, Andy kicked us off and his, his main point of this sermon was that transformed people transform their relationships. Meaning that if God has changed your life, then you're going to interact with people in a different kind of way. He's going to change the way that you relate to other people. And so this week I have been given the very fun topic of relating to difficult humans. Anybody got some difficult people in your life? Maybe you work with some difficult people. Maybe, maybe you live with some difficult people. You got some neighbors that are hard to be around. Everybody at all, your, all of our campuses, just raise your hand if you are a difficult person. I mean, go ahead, be honest. Everybody's hand in every single room should be raised because we are all difficult people come from time to time. Now, I was thinking about what makes a person difficult? What are the, the people that are difficult in my own life? What are the qualities that make them difficult? I just wrote down a few. You might recognize them. Argumentative, contrarian, grumpy, irritable, unmotivated. Maybe they don't follow through. Maybe they're demanding, they're rude, they're unpredictable, they got mood swings. They're selfish, they're unaccommodating, dishonest, deceitful, maybe just downright annoying. Anybody recognize some of those qualities in the people that you're relating to or even within yourself? You're like, okay, I'm honest. I know, I know I am those things. Well, it's funny how relating to difficult people and, it, and getting stuck in those moments, because doesn't it always feel like it kind of climaxes to a moment and it, it like brings the monster out of us. You know what I'm talking about? You guys want to hear a story about one time a monster came out of me? <laughs> I can't believe I'm going to share this story with you because I've, this is only my second time up here to speak at Saddleback Church. And so it feels very vulnerable to be up here and going to share this story. But here we go. You guys are going to get to know me real fast. You got to know a couple things first. First, I have Cademan's full permission to share this story. Cademan's my son. He's involved. But the story is much more about me being a monster than him being a teenager, okay? Now, secondly, you need to know that I love the first day of school. I don't know what it is about the first day of school, but it, the, the kids all have their hair combed for once and they have fresh shoes on and school supplies that look like they haven't been through the garbage disposal yet. And so there's just like so much hope and promise in the first day of school, like maybe this year is gonna be a good year. And so I, I love the first day of school. And this particular story happens on the first day of school 2021 which if you recall, was the first time we were back in school in person since the pandemic. At least that was true here in California. And so I don't know if you have this same tradition in your family. In our family, we take pictures of our kids on their first day of school. So I thought I'd show you my kids' pictures these days. So this is Karis on her first day last year going into second. Isn't she a doll? I mean, her hair is braided and she's got on her new little outfit. She's just so cute. And then you got Sammy going into the seventh grade last year, my handsome son. But guys, I have to tell you, 
not always as it should have been on Cade Men's first day of school that year. You guys don't need to know all the details of the story, but I'll just say this. There was a bit of a debacle about Cade Men's cell phone. And any parent of a teenager knows that a conversation about your child's cell phone can go through the roof in like 2.5 seconds flat. It can get very heated very quickly. And that is what was going down on this morning. And so Andy walks through the kitchen and this is happening. And he's like, oh, I don't know if I got it in me today. And I was like, it's cool, babe. I got this. I am totally cool. Sometimes I impress myself with how cool that I can be. I mean, I was like under control, calm, quiet voice. I've got this. But you guys, I don't know what happened. But we got derailed and I lost my cool. Something was said that just took it right over the line. And I, we were running late. And I hate running late. I especially hate running late on the first day of school. And I could just sense that we were not gonna get that first day of school picture. And so we were like headed toward crisis mode really quickly. And by this point, Andy has just left the vicinity. He's like, I'm gonna go wait in the car. And I was like, it's cool, babe. You go listen to your worship music. Meanwhile, there's a volcano erupting in your kitchen, but we've got this, it's cool, we're fine. So. Actually, I was not fine. And I, I could hear myself starting to yell. You know how you're like trying really hard not to yell, but it's like still coming out as a yell. And I, I'm like, you can't talk to me that way. You're gonna be late on your first day of high school. I can't believe that this is gonna be the one year that I don't have a picture of you on your first day of school. And when I said that, Cayman goes, oh, you want your stupid picture? I'll take your stupid picture. And he comes and he gets my phone right off the counter and he walks outside and he gets a selfie for his first day of school picture. This is what I got. <laughs> I was not laughing. <laughs> I have literally lost my mind by this point. I am acting like a complete lunatic. I'm not even exaggerating here. I pick up his backpack and walk to the back door and I throw it at the car. And then I come back inside and I pick up both of his shoes, which were not on his feet where they were supposed to be. And I walk to the back door and I throw them overhand one by one at the car. And by this point, I know that my neighbors can hear me yelling. And I'm just, I'm like, just go. Get in the car, have a great first day of high school. <laughs> now Andy, Andy is sitting in that car and he is just looking at me. And he's like, I have been there before, but I'm really glad it's not me right now losing my mind. So they get, they get in the car and they leave and I'm left like standing in the garage and I'm just like, oh, and my heart is beating and I'm sweating and I just feel so Gross, and I'm like, ah, oh, how did this happen? This is not the me that I want to be. And I, I just wonder, have you ever been there? And maybe your story is not quite as colorful as mine. <laughs> but we just, we have these moments, these difficult moments in our life and it just brings out the monster inside of us and and like we want to blame them right like that's the tendency it's like if you would just cooperate if you would just let me merge when you see my blinker on if you would just do the thing that you said you were going to do then I would not be forced to lose my ever loving mind and act like a complete moron you drove me to this like that's how we feel right but, but deep inside of our hearts, like we know, we, we know that my response is my responsibility. That's a phrase that we say a lot in our house. My response is my responsibility. Your response is your responsibility. And I'm sorry he just said that to you. And I'm sorry he just did that to you. And I can deal with that in a minute, but right now your response is your responsibility. And, I, and the reality is like, I, I may not be able to control them but I, I sure better be able to control me. And so last week, Andy was teaching us that, that actually when it comes to relating to humans, that we're supposed to be imitators of God. And that is a tall order. If you look in Ephesians chapter five, verse one, it says that be imitators of God, therefore, 
as dearly loved children and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. So we're supposed to reflect the character of Christ. And what Andy was teaching us is that we can only reflect what we have first received. So I can only reflect the love of God once I have received the love of God. And I can only reflect the the forgiveness of God once I have received the forgiveness of God. And so we have to be really intentional about our inputs, what we are receiving. Because if all I am receiving is crazy, I'm gonna reflect crazy. If all I'm receiving is this toxic behavior or what culture is feeding me, that's what I'm gonna reflect. But God has called us to a different standard. And my personality is not the standard. And the way that I was raised is not the standard. And the culture around me is not the standard. The standard is Jesus for the way that I, that I interact with other people. And so if I want Jesus to be the standard for me, and, and if that's what I want to reflect back, then I have to be really intentional to receive from him. What I've come to find to be true in my own life is the more difficult the person is that I'm relating to, the more desperate I am to receive from Jesus because I'm already getting a lot of toxic behavior from this relationship. And so I need to supersede that with the amount of of input I get from Jesus in order to be able to reflect him instead of this over here. So it's this process of receiving and reflecting and receiving and reflecting. The more, that you, the more that we receive from Jesus, the better a reflection of him that we're gonna become. And, and here's an interesting way to think about it. Difficult people can actually help us with this process of reflecting Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but difficult people don't really bring the Jesus out of me. Like they bring like demons out of me or something, like monsters come out of me. And and I know that you feel so much more like Jesus when you're with people that are easy to be with. Like, Like you're just so kind and loving and patient when you're with people who are kind and loving and patient, right? Like I like to be with people like that. They make me feel good about me. But what Jesus is saying here is that there is a, there is a higher standard for just loving the people that love you. Because what's true is that, diff- that those impurities, that toxicness that's down inside of all of us, that brokenness that we all have, it's still there when we're interacting with people that are easy to be with. We're just able to cover it up. We can push it down. We can pretend like it's not there. But the difficult people in our life, they bring it right up to the surface. And you're like, oh, wow, where did that come from? Never knew I struggled with anger, but it's like, oh no, it, it's been in there all along. It came from within. But those difficult people do actually a service to us because they bring it up and they require us to stare straight in the face to that stuff that's in our life. And it gives God the opportunity to come along and to purify it. So they're actually serving a purpose. Now, as I was preparing for this message, I did a bit of a deep dive on the process of refining silver. It's actually a really fascinating process. I knew like a little bit before I did the deep dive, I knew that you had to expose the metal to like intense heat and that the pure stuff would sink and the dross would float and then a silversmith comes along and scrapes it off. And I also knew that the Bible talks a little bit about this process of bringing purity to our hearts. So I looked up those verses. There's one in Proverbs 17, and it says, the crucible for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. And then over in Psalm 66, it says, for you, O God, tested us. You refined us like silver. So basically, I knew the parallel that I wanted to draw here was that if you expose a metal to really intense heat and pressure, impurities will rise. And if you expose a human to really intense heat and pressure, impurities will rise. I knew that was the parallel I wanted to make. Uh, I had already heard it made before. But what I didn't realize before my YouTube viewing and all of my website reading is that this is a very long and complicated process. So I have up here on stage a couple samples of silver ore. This is from a mine in Colorado. And um, 
It doesn't look like much. It basically just looks like rock. Uh, but inside this rock, uh, there is a little bit of silver. And if you knew what you were doing, you could get it down to a pure form. It wouldn't be much silver, but it would be a little bit. These rocks aren't worth much money, like less than 10 bucks. But if you had the same amount of pure silver, like the same size and weight of this rock, it would be closer to like $2,500. So the purity of the silver is what makes it so valuable. And, and the process of getting it to a pure state is super fascinating. There's so many parallels. Like the first step is to crush the rock into a fine powder. And I was just thinking about how many times in life have you felt crushed by relationships, just like absolutely ground down. And like almost like you lost yourself in this really painful, difficult relationship. But I wonder if we could kind of reframe that experience and that pain for you, that, that maybe that crushing could be the first step in bringing something absolutely beautiful and valuable out of that experience for your life. The next step after you've crushed the rock is you have to take all that powder, put it in a crucible and submit it to really intense heat, like upwards of 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. And it stays there for a super long time until it turns into this molten state and the, the rock begins to like boil like lava or magma. And, and the impurities will float and the pure stuff will sink. And then you take it out of the flame and you let it sit and cool for a really long time. And then the silversmith can knock off the top layer and he's left with this substance, but it's not pure silver yet. That, that substance has to go back into the fire. And this process is repeated over and over again. It's not a one and done process. I was just so shocked by how long it took, how many times this, this substance had to be put back into the fire. And the thing that that said to me is that difficult people will always be with us. Like we're not getting away from it. We're gonna just keep going back in the fire. Like you think that you got through that one difficult relationship, but look out, there's another one coming because there, we, God is doing something to bring these impurities to the surface so that he can bring us to a more pure hearted state. He's making something beautiful out of us, but purification is a process, it takes time, it's not easy. And, and God is doing this hard work of, of purifying us and, and making us more beautiful and more valuable and more reflective, but it's gonna take time and it's gonna take us getting back in the fire over and over again. Did you know that silver is one of the most reflective metals? When it comes to a pure form, it can reflect up to 90% of the light. And so it's so pure and reflective that I can see myself in this. It's like a mirror. The more pure the silver is, the more reflective it becomes. And isn't that the same as our hearts? The more pure our heart is, the more reflective of the character of Jesus we become. But we have, to, we have to be submitted to the fire. We have to be willing to go through the pressure and the heat to allow those impurities to be brought out. This is how we become an imitator of God. It's not by trying harder. It's not by just deciding that we're gonna be. It's like, no, we're gonna go through some trials in this life. There's gonna be some painful circumstances, some difficulties that we face, but God's using it. So the bad news is that the difficult people are not going away. They will always be with us. But the good news is that he's doing something beautiful inside of us as a result of relating to them. But the question that remains is how? Like how does God want us to interact with all these like argumentative, contrarian, annoying, rude people in our lives? Like what, how does this, what does this actually look like? And so I want us to look at, the, at a chapter in Ephesians chapter four. And the apostle Paul is the one who has written this section of scripture. And what you need to know is that Paul is writing this from prison. He literally has shackles on his hands and feet when he is writing this. He is like tied to a Roman guard. And so keep that in mind as you are reading this book of Ephesians and thinking about how he's teaching us to love people. Like if he can love people in this situation, like that's varsity, like there's no excuses for us, right? We can do this. He's setting the example for us and he's gonna remind the people of Ephesus that, that I'm in prison 
And so if I can do it, you can do it. And he's going to give us some kind of difficult instruction. Very simple, very clear, but not easy. Look at verse 1 and 2. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Now we can get kind of caught up on that word calling, live a life worthy of the calling that you've received. Like, I don't know, did God ever call me? I haven't heard his voice. What does that even mean? I'm going to go move to Africa as a missionary. I don't know. No, what all that means is all throughout history, any person that would identify themselves as a follower of Jesus, they have been called. It's an invitation from the Holy Spirit to carry the name of Jesus, to be his representation on earth. And so wherever you go, you take the name of Jesus with you. So as you walk into that meeting at your place of work, you are carrying the name of Jesus with you. Students, as you walk into that classroom, you are carrying the name of Jesus with you into that classroom. If you're at some type of social gathering with your friends or your family, you are God's representation there at that place. And so what Paul is saying is, Just live a life that's worthy of being God's representative. And so he's going to tell us three things to do. And they, like I said, they're simple and they're clear, but they're not easy. And the first thing he says is to be completely humble and gentle. Completely humble and gentle. And I, I captured that phrase by saying, don't take the bait. Now I want you for a second to think about the people in your life. Like people that you know personally, think about celebrities, think about professional athletes, politicians, anyone in our culture. And I want you to think, do I know anyone that I would say is completely humble and gentle? Like that is not the kind of person that our culture is producing these days. Like that's not what you're going to learn when you go to school for an MBA. Those aren't the qualities that that we're raising up as important, humility and gentleness. If our modern day society had a mantra, it's going to be something a lot more like, come at me, bro, you want to go? Like, Like this is not a humble and gentle posture that we have. But Paul is saying, hey, let me, let me introduce you to a different way of doing life and relationships with one another. When people come at us and they're, and they're just irrational or they're harsh or they're derogatory or they're provocative, the, the way that we tend to want to respond is we want to match them. Like if they show up big, we need to show up bigger. Because if we don't, we think we're going to get taken advantage of, of that we're going to get manipulated. But actually what Paul is saying is there's more power for you in a gentle response. I I like this verse that uh, is in Proverbs 15. I say this to myself all the time. A gentle answer turns away wrath. But a harsh word stirs up anger. I think about this a lot as a mom when I'm walking into a situation where there's a lot of harsh words flying around between siblings. And in that moment I have the option, do I walk in with harsh words If I do that, I'm just going to inflate the situation and make it even worse. Or I could walk in with a gentle answer, a gentle response. And what that does is it de-escalates the whole situation. It, It can take an irrational person and calm them down. There is power, the Bible is saying, in a gentle response. This works in your family. This works with your relationships at work. It works in the grocery store. One time Auntie was in a grocery store and he about had to break up a fist fight with two grown men in the middle of COVID because everyone was crazy. And it was like, no, what was needed in that moment was a gentle response. It wasn't to show up bigger. You know, I think sometimes it's just so tempting to take the bait, isn't it? Because people bait us with their comments. I, I think sometimes people just get a kick out of baiting people with their comments. And it's like, oh, yeah, I know exactly what to say back to you right now. And that bait looks so tempting that you just want to grab onto it. But the thing is, we can swim on by. We do not have to take the bait. What we need to do is remind ourselves that there is a hook in that bait. And if we take it, it will cost us. There's a better way to relate to one another. And our harsh words, are, they're only going to stir up more anger. They're only going to make the situation worse. But your gentle answer, man, it can turn away all that anger and wrath. There is a better way. You don't have to take the bait. 
you can be completely humble and gentle. Now, the second thing that Paul says is that we can be patient. We can be patient. Now, raise your hand at all of our campuses if you enjoy being patient. Anybody? Anybody? I mean, who likes to go to the DMV? Who wants to just sit in one of those plastic chairs? I had that great experience last week. Just, I just love sitting here all morning waiting patiently for my turn. Now, nobody really enjoys being patient. That means I'm not getting what I want right now, so I have to be patient. Like, that's not that fun of an opportunity. But what Paul is saying here is that, man, this is, the, this is the way to make progress in our relationships, to get out of a stalemate, is to be patient. I captured this phrase by stay at the table. Stay at the table. Right now we have a ping pong table in, our, in one of our living rooms because we haven't bought furniture yet. And so there's just a ping pong table there. But it's really fun actually to have a ping pong table in your living room. People come over and they play games. And, and I've discovered that there are a few different types of ping pong players. One type of person loves to smash the ball, just slam it. Every time they get a chance, they just love it. It like lights them up. To, and then that other poor person's just like chasing that ball around the room. And, and, and so that's one type of player. The other type of player is the person that has to chase the ball. They're the one getting slammed at. And they're like, oh, this is not even fun. I'm like, I'm out of here. It's not worth it. And so the point of a relationship, though, is to stay at the table, just to keep it in play. Like, don't slam the ball and don't get so frustrated you just walk away. That's our tendency, right? Like, some of you, like, when you get into a conflict, you are just looking for an opportunity to slam it. You're like, oh, I'm going to say that. I'm going to just get it all out there. I'm going to just say all the things that need to be said and mic drop that person. You need to back down. But then there are other people that you, that you are just on the receiving end of that and, you're, and you get so hurt and you're so annoyed and there's like this bitterness that's growing up inside of you and you're so frustrated with the situation that you're like, it's not even worth it to me anymore. I'm out of here. And you need to come back to the table because the goal in the relationship is to stay at the table and keep it in play. And we could say to each other, you know, we got this thing in between us right now. But I just need you to be patient with me because I'm a work in progress. Purification is a process and God's not done with me yet. And I know I need to be patient with you because clearly God's not done with you yet either. <laughs> and we just, let's be patient with one another and stay here at the table. This word that Paul uses for patience in the Greek is a word called macrothemia. And it's, it's a two-part word. And the first part means long, and the second part means temper. So a long temper, which is the opposite of a short temper. You guys know anything about a short temper? Like we're talking about the opposite thing than that. We're talking about this ability to have long suffering in relationships. And God, or Paul uses this same word, macrothemia, in Galatians 5, where he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Where he says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, macrothemia. And, and what that says is that this is not something that we just muster up from the inside. This is not an issue of behavior modification. This type of patience only comes from the Holy Spirit. It doesn't come from trying harder. You can try harder for a little while to be patient, but eventually you're going to get worn out and give up. But what the Holy Spirit does when we yield to him is he literally is changing us from the inside out. He changes what we think about. He changes what we care about, what matters to us, what we value. And little by little, he is forming us to become more like Christ. And so our role in this is to yield to the Holy Spirit so that he can do the work of growing patience in us. Some of you are engaged in a relationship right now and you are so tempted to walk away from the table. And I just wonder if possibly God's word for you is to stay at the table today. And maybe, maybe if you have a little bit more patience, if you could endure, if you could see that God is doing something in this process, that maybe he could restore what you thought was a lost cause. Next week, we're going to be talking about dysfunctional relationships and destructive relationships. That's a different thing. And there's a different, there's a different call when you're in a relationship that is actually destructive. But for many of us, we're just annoyed to the point of ready to quit. 
And if that's your story, I want to encourage you, stay at the table. Now, the third thing Paul says is not only should we be completely humble and gentle and that we should be patient with one another, but also that we should bear with one another in love. And I captured this by saying that we should choose to love. Choose to love. I think that it's so interesting that Paul uses the phrase bear with one another in love because don't those things feel like two completely different things? Like you either love something or you have to bear with it. Like, oh, I love to do this. I can't bear to do that. You know what I mean? It's like opposite situations. But I think it's so genius that Paul put the two together because he knew that there are going to be people in all of our lives that they're just hard to love. You have to bear with them in love. And so it's not always going to feel like when you're out with your friends and you're like, ah, I just love you guys. And it's not always going to feel like your wedding day when you're like, oh, this is so perfect and fun and I just am so in love with you. This, this is a different kind of love. It's not based on convenience. It's based on commitment. It's a, it's a higher form of love that Jesus is calling us into. You know, Jesus said when he was here on earth, he said, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Like everybody can do that. But, there, but Jesus is calling his community to love differently, to love differently than the world around us. When I think about the cross that Jesus died on, it's like two different beams on the cross. There's a vertical beam and a horizontal one. And I think about that vertical beam as representing that Jesus brought healing and restoration and reconciliation in our relationship with God. He made a way for there to be forgiveness of sins so that we could be restored to God. But there's also that horizontal beam that represents his cross was so that we could be reconciled to one another as well. That there's something bigger that we can come up underneath besides all the little things that divide us. When he was here on this earth, he did everything he could to blur the lines between what divides us. He was flipping upside down all these categories that say you belong and you don't belong. And when he was here, he created this band of brothers, a group of 12 disciples. And he was so intentional about how, who he invited to be in that 12 disciples group. And one guy's name was Simon. And Simon was a zealot. And a zealot was someone that was like a part of a political faction. They were a Jewish political party and their goal was to overthrow the Roman oppression against the Jews. And they were a passionate group of freedom fighters. And they believed that the end justified the means. And so whatever they had to do to get their freedom was worth it. So if they had to resort to violence, so be it. If they had to steal, if they had to assassinate from someone, it was all fair game because they were freedom fighters. And many Jewish people would have seen this group of zealots as a heroic and courageous group of people. And that was Simon. But Jesus also invited a guy named Matthew to come and be a part of his group. And Matthew was a Jewish guy that worked for the Roman government. And in like the worst possible kind of way, he collected taxes from his own people to give to the people that were oppressing his people. So many people would have seen Matthew as a complete traitor. And yet Jesus said, hey, I want you at the table too. Do you think Simon and Matthew ever had to bear with one another in love? Like Matthew was certainly seen as a traitor by Simon. And yet Jesus said, listen, guys, I'm going to show you that there's something bitter, bigger than this political system that divides us. There's something bigger than all of these little values that we cling so tightly to. That at the end of the day, at the end of all time, there will be two things that remi remain, and that is the kingdom of God and people's souls. And when we can have that at the front of our minds, we can be reminded that there is something more at stake than my personal preferences. That I can come up under the cross of Jesus Christ, the God, the God that loves us and died for us, and even that difficult person that nobody can get along with, God loves him just as much as God loves me. And that's what God, Jesus was wanting to remind us. The early church created this community 
that was so vastly different than the culture around them. And so you might have a wealthy, educated man at church worshiping beside a slave. That would have never happened. Or you would have people from all different ethnic backgrounds, all different cultures gathered around one table to share a meal because they had Jesus in common. And that would have never happened. And there were people that society had marginalized, like women and children and the poor. And they were invited into this table to say, you have worth and value and significance. Jesus was creating a whole different way of relating to one another. It was this beautiful community that he was forming. And it was so different than the world around them. And it's what the world had to take notice of. There was no way they could ignore it, this community that was forming and building. And it's the reason why they were hated. It's the reason why the early Christians were persecuted, because they were so different. But it's also what made them attractive. It's also the thing that made people on the outside want to get on the inside because they could see how differently they loved They chose to love. They did the hard work of love. They stayed at the table when it would have been easier to walk away. They did the including and the forgiving. They chose to love in a different type of way. Jesus said that the whole world will know that you are my disciples. How? By the way that you love. We don't love the way that culture loves. We love differently. You guys, this is what it looks like to live a life worthy of the calling of Jesus. That we, that we don't give up on people, that we choose to, to love them, that we choose to stay at the table with them, that we don't take the bait, but we can be gentle and patient with one another. I know that if you're feeling anything like me, you're feeling a lot more like this silver ore in its raw form then you do a beautiful piece of reflective silver in its pure form. Because you know, like I know, you've got all these impurities in your heart. And the way that you relate to your kids, and the way that you relate to your spouse, and the way you're relating to your roommate or your boss, like it's, it's not a good reflection of Jesus. And all that stuff just bubbles up to the surface and it can be so discouraging. Because sometimes for me, I'm like, why am I still responding this way? I have walked with Jesus for years and years and years, and still I feel angry sometimes, and still I'm impatient, and still all this nasty stuff bubbles up to the surface, and it can feel so discouraging. Why do I still look like a raw piece of rock? But what I want to say to you today, friend, is that God loves you right there. He loves you in the middle of your brokenness in the middle of all that impurity, in the middle of your dysfunctional relationships. You don't have to polish yourself up before you come to God. That's not even your job. That's the Holy Spirit's job. He is the one that does all the purifying. Your role in all of this, your work that you get to do, the way you participate is you just open yourself up to what it is that God wants to do in your heart. You acknowledge, I can't do this on my own. I am in need of you to do the work of making my heart pure. I wanna be a better reflection of you, Jesus. I want to treat people the way you want me to. I want to love that difficult person the way that you do, but I can't do it on my own. And so friend, I I just wanna create a little space right now for the Holy Spirit to move in all of our hearts and to say, what is it that you want to do? What what is bubbling up in the surface of my heart that you're putting your finger on that you wanna clean up today? Could we make some space for him? I wanna ask you to stand at all of our campuses. Would you just stand? And I I wanna encourage you with this thought. That there there is beauty inside of you. There is something of such significant value and worth. And it might be in its raw form right now, but God is working on you and he wants to bring it out of you. And if you will yield yourself to him, if you'll just open the door 
and say, whatever it is that you wanna do in my heart, today I make room for you. So come and do what you would in my life. Would you bow your heads with me? I'm just gonna pray over us. The band is gonna lead us into a moment of response and reflection. So Holy Spirit, we invite you to come. We invite you to work in our hearts, to convict us of sin. God, we're not just dealing with difficult people, we are difficult people. And we need you to come and purify us. We believe that you take our ashes and you turn them into something beautiful. That brokenness, that thing in us that's been so crushed, that was just the first phase of beauty on the, on the way. So God, we, we just invite you into this moment. We invite you in to do whatever it is in our hearts that you wanna do. Would you move among us now? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. The Lord is face to me. One more time. The Lord bless you, everybody.
Hallelujah. Have a blessed Sunday and then a blessed next week. What a powerful time of worship. What a powerful message by Pastor Stacy today. Before we close, let me point out to you what's going to happen at Sederbeck Berlin over uh, the Christmas season. On November, I think it's November 26th, on Advent 1st, um, we will start to have a few Christmas decorations here and there, but it is a tradition at Sederbeck Berlin to give out Christmas calendars or Advent calendars, whatever you want to call it, um, on Advent 1st. And we will do this this year as well. So make sure to be there in person um, on the 1st of Advent to get your Christmas calendar. We will actually give out two um, Christmas calendars per person so that you can give one away to someone that you love. On uh, the, second, uh, of, of the second of Advent, we will have slightly more Christmas, um, uh, Christmas themed decorations. We will have a little bit more Christmas things uh, uh, on the coffee bar. We will sing more Christmas songs so we all get into this Christmas mood. And we will have some, um, some small presents for the kids for St. Nicholas. Now St. Nicholas will happen, I think, two or three days after the second, uh, uh, the second of Advent. Um, but we want to give them something anyway. On uh, the third of Advent, we will have a family service. We will have a, a worship together Sunday where we uh, worship together with families, with everyone that is there, together, adults and kids, will be an, an amazing time. And we will have more Christmas decorations and more things, uh, more Christmassy things on the coffee bar. And then on the fourth of Advent, um, we will have a, a full on Christmas service, um, full decorated um, Christmas songs only, um, a lot of Christmas treats at the coffee bar and so on. So. Um, we really want you to get into this Christmas mood slowly but slowly um, and um, we get to the high point at our Christmas Eve service. Christmas Eve service December 24th will uh, take place at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. It will be a shorter service probably about an hour long so that you can go home afterwards uh, have dinner with your family and unwrap all of the presents. We will not have an in-person worship service for Christmas Day um, and we will have an online service only for New Year's Day. Um, January 1st is a Sunday this year um, and we will have an online service only. So if you want to see all of that uh, again um, go to our website setback.berlin and check out the event calendar everything um, is already in there. Um, sign up for the newsletter to receive updates on all of this. And now we are coming to an end of this uh, online service and I want to use this time to pray for you. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for everyone that, that joins this online service today. Um, I want to ask you to bless everyone so that they can experience your grace and your love and the fellowship of your spirit in this coming week. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Let me quickly point out to you, if you want to contact us, if you have questions, feedback, um, a decision that you want to uh, talk to us about, fill out an online connection card. There is more to this online connection card. If you're new here, definitely check it out and let us know that you are watching. Also, if you like to contribute, if you like to um, to worship God through your givings, you can use the gift button as well to give to our church. Um, and with that being said, I, wanna, uh, I want to wish you uh, a great Sunday and a great week ahead. See you next Sunday. Bye.